or you can answer no. If you don't answer at all, I will assume the answer is I don't know. Okay? So we understand the rules of the question. And it's actually the most important question I think I can ask you today. And here's the question. And I want you to think about it before I ask you to vote on it. Is that right up here? Do you believe that Jesus Christ is who he says he is? Do you believe that Jesus Christ is who he says he is? Your mic just stopped. It's what? It's stopped. There it is, still on. Okay. So let me repeat. Do you believe that Jesus Christ is who he says he is? Now, he makes some amazing claims. He says he's the light of the world. He says he's the truth. He says he's the way. Get this. He says he is the son of God. Nothing less audacious than the son of God. That's a big claim. And so I'm going to ask you to raise your hands. Either you believe he is who he says he is, or you don't believe who he says he is, and that's okay, because you're in the right place if you're not, you know, if you're, if you're Captain President. Or if you don't raise your hand, I'm going to assume you don't know. You're not sure. Okay? Everybody understand the rules? All right. So if you believe that Jesus Christ is who he says he is, raise your hand now. Okay? Fair enough. I'm going to give you a chance for those who don't think he is who he says he is to raise your hand now too. Well, Father, that's good. We've got a good, we've got a good crowd here today because they believe who he says he is. So unfortunately for you, because you all answered the question the way you answered it, I've got a second question for you. And this one's a lot tougher. <sighs> if you believe Jesus Christ is who he says he is, then why aren't we doing exactly what he told us to do? I mean, this is really... And here's why. Just a few minutes ago, there was a prayer that you read. Maybe you went and read it real quickly. And it's a selfish prayer. At the end of our lives, we pray that, that, that we don't have a lot of pain. We, we pray that we're Christian. We pray that it's blameless and peaceful. But here it is. Here's the big ask. You ask for a good, you use, use the word defense. That's fine. I'll use your word. A good defense before the awesome judgment seat of Christ. That's what you ask for. Just a few minutes ago, this divine liturgy, which means, of course, you know that someday you will stand before Jesus Christ and you will be defending something, probably the, the way you live your life. Now, in school, I always loved it when the teacher would tell me exactly what was going to be on the exam. Right? Because then all I had to study for was just what was going to be on the exam. Now, you should study a lot more, okay? You young folks, just, just study everything. But at least you ought to study what's on the exam, right? And so our Lord and Savior, the person who you said, you believe he is who he says he is, the Son of God, told you, I'm opening the book and I'm giving you the pathway. And here's what you get when you get 100%. You get eternal life. You get a salvific salvation in heaven with God himself in the presence of all the angels, in the presence of God willing of all these wonderful people that pass before us. Oh, do you understand what he's giving you? And all you got to do is pass the test when you have that good defense before the awesome judgment seat of Christ. And here's the challenge. When you open the books and when you read the Holy Gospel, the New Testament, there's a lot of stuff in it. And some of it, let's be honest, is a little bit hard for us to understand in the year 2022 when it was written in 33 AD or 40 AD or 50 AD or 60 AD. So I'm going to see if I can give you the Bill Marianas Cliffs Note version, the simple way to think about it, right? So when you think about the fact that you said Jesus Christ says who he says he is, we see, we see the letter C, and I'm going to give you Christ's three C messages, his three C messages. I think if you just start with getting these three C messages right, you're going to be in good shape as life goes on. So here's the first one. And context is so important. I call it Christ's great charge. His great charge. What he charged us to do. You've heard of it as the parable of the Good Samaritan. Here's the problem. 
In Holy Scripture, which took place thousands of years ago, things were different. And sometimes if we don't understand the context of the time, we don't really understand the story. So let me set the story. There were in those days Jews and there were Samaritans. They were the Hatfields and the McCoys. They didn't get along. They were the people from the University of Florida and the people who cheered for Florida State or Miami. They just didn't get along. They didn't like each other. They couldn't stand each other. They couldn't be in the same place with each other. They couldn't talk to each other. They couldn't, they couldn't touch each other. They couldn't even be on the same side of the street with each other. Do you understand how much they disliked each other? This is really important for you to understand this because otherwise the story kind of loses its, is its message. So Christ gathers all people together and they're asking them some smart aleck questions about, well, who's my neighbor? You know, kind of like, I'll see if we can trick the Lord, right? And he says, let me tell you a story. Because that's what he did. He taught in parables. And then he tells them a story. And in this story, he says, there was a Jewish guy who got beat up and left for dead on the side of the road, injured, bloody, a mess on the side of the road. That's bad. They all knew that was bad. But they all had listened to his stories enough to know that Jesus always had a hero in the story. There was a message. There was somebody that came forward. And so he goes, and then a Jewish guy came up. Now remember, this was a Jewish audience. They wanted, they were rooting for the Jewish guy. He wasn't the guy that helped the man that was on the side of the road. Then he said a priest came up. They said, well, surely the priest would be the one that stands up and does He wasn't the priest. And then Christ, bless you. And then Christ says, and there was a Samaritan. Now you can hear a hush in the room, I suspect. Because they knew the Samaritans were the bad guys. And yet somebody's always got to be the good guy in Christ's story. And you can imagine the Jews going, oh, please don't let it be the Samaritan. Please don't be the Samaritan. Please don't let it be the Samaritan. And it was the Samaritan. And then Christ says that the Samaritan stopped. What? And he talked and he bent over the Jewish guy that was injured. Are you kidding me? And then, and this was unbelievable, at the time, this was unimaginable, he touched him. A Samaritan touched a Jewish man, and he tended his wounds. That, it, they were just like shaking, I'm sure, at that moment. And then he put him on his donkey. Now, you know, we don't think much about a big deal about a donkey, because not very many of you drove a donkey to church today, right? But in the day, that was like the vehicle. He puts him in his vehicle, and he takes him to the hotel, and he says, I'll pay all of his expenses. And all these people are like, <gasps> They've never heard of such a thing. And then, as if he has them right on the precipice, he just zings them at the end. He said, go and do likewise. Go and do likewise. What he said to them is, look, if you see a Jewish guy on the side of the road, of course you should help him. But if you see a Samaritan on the side of the road, of course you should help him. You are charged, Christ's great charge to you is to go and do likewise, not just to your friends and your family, but to anybody who needs it, including those who you might have thought were your enemies or the people you shouldn't support. That was Christ's great charge. So here's my question to you. Today, I want you to think, who is your Samaritan? Who's somebody who you probably weren't thinking about helping that Christ has told you in the great charge you are to help. Let's go to the second C message. This one is equally as amazing. Christ is at the end of his ministry. He's getting ready to leave. Now those of you who are parents know that the last set of instructions you give to your kids before they leave is usually the most important. Like, be home before midnight, don't drink and drive, stay away from stop, you know, whatever, okay. So, so here it is, Christ has gathered the apostles together and he says something which we don't think of when he says it. We just kind of wash over it because it just sounds like words. But the word is really important when you understand the context of Scripture. Christ looks at his apostles and he says, A new commandment I give you. And we kind of think, oh, okay, that's great. He gave a new commandment. No, no, but here's what you have to understand. In those days, there was only one person that could give a commandment. It wasn't the king, it wasn't the emperor, it wasn't the Sadducees, it wasn't the Pharisees, it wasn't even your mother. The only person that could give a commandment in those days was God himself. And here's this guy saying a new commandment I give you. And when he said that, what he was saying is, I am speaking as God in this moment. Now that's why it was earth shattering at the moment when they listened to it. We just kind of wash over that word. What he said next was amazing. It's probably the most difficult thing he asked them to do. 
If you remember in John 13, 34, he said the commandment that he gave them was to love one another. Now in this moment, we don't really know, I, I just have this visual image, the story in my mind. St. Peter kind of leans into Jesus Christ and he says, hey, Lord, there's that Judas over there. you telling me love one another, I gotta love him? And you can just imagine Jesus looking at St. Peter and going, yep, even him. And then what he says next is even more amazing, but they didn't understand it at the time. He said, that you should love one another, how? As I love you. Now it was a couple days later before he died on the cross after being scourged and beaten that they would understand how much he loved them. But then here's the key word, and don't miss this, folks. Do you know what the easiest thing in America is to be? It's easy to be a Christian. You say, well, that doesn't sound right. Yeah, that's easy. Walk into any Christian church in America, meet the minimum membership requirements, and you can say, I'm a Christian. But that's not what the followers of Jesus Christ were called. In fact, if you look at Holy Scripture, there's only about three times that the word Christian is used, and it's always in a pejorative context. So what did Jesus Christ call his followers? He says it in John 13, 35. At the end of this commandment, he says, by this... They will know you are my, here's the word, disciples, that you have love for one another. In other words, walking into a church doesn't make you a disciple of Jesus Christ. I'm sorry, it's great that you're here, we're delighted you're here, keep coming here, that's not enough. What your guy, the man you said was God himself, who you believe is who he said it is said, you have to do, is to love one another as he loved us. That's what it means to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. So if you want to call yourself an Orthodox Christian, and I hope you do, and if you want to call yourself a, dis a disciple of Jesus Christ, and I hope you do, then i got to ask you, who have you loved as Christ loved you? Are you the personification of love? In the Holy Scripture passage that we just heard, I hope you didn't miss it. This was really incredible. This was amazing. It's, it's page five of your hymnals, right? What he said is something that was just truly outstanding. You, and you, and you in the back hiding, are the light of the world. You're the light of the world. What does it mean to be the light of the world? See, darkness isn't a thing. Darkness is merely the absence of light. And so what he means is that you, and you, and you, and you, and you, and all of us, even this sinful guy, are called to be the light of the world the light of Jesus Christ to share that unconditional love with one another so that we can one day be called disciples of Jesus Christ. So who today are you going to make a disciple? To whom will you be a disciple? To whom will you share love this very day and every day of your life? The last scene. We call it the Great Commission. It's not where you sell an insurance policy and you get a payment return. The Great Commission is kind of at the end of the day and here's what Jesus Christ said to all of his apostles and by the way, he's saying it to you because you are the heirs of the apostles. He said, go forth and make disciples of just the people you like from your village in the old country or in Daytona Beach. Don't worry about anybody else. If you've been paying attention in church, you would say that's not exactly what he said. What he said is, go and make disciples of all nations. Now, we had to do this in sequence because until we learned in John 13, 34, 35, what the word disciple meant, we don't fully understand what the Great Commission is. Because he said, go and make disciples of all nations. Go and love the world. Go and share the word. Go and be the light with everybody. That's what it means to in the Great Commission to make disciples of all nations. And so I've got to ask you, who today will you make a disciple of Jesus Christ? Who today, out here, not in this church, when you walk out this door, to whom will you be the light of the world? To whom will you go and do likewise? Who's your Samaritan? Whom will you love so that you can be a disciple of Jesus Christ, as we learn in John 13, 34, the Great Commandment? And who Will you make a disciple of Jesus Christ?
by being the light of the world and sharing the love. Do you understand? You have that power. You don't need it from Father Joseph. You don't need it from his eminence, much of Paul Alexios, or Archbishop Peter Boris, or even the ecumenical patriarch. God has given you that power. Because every day of your life, he gives you a no unbelievable number of gifts in particular that I want you to focus on. The first is 24 hours. You have 24 hours to love someone. You have 24 hours to serve someone, to be a, to take a Samaritan and help them. You have 24 hours to make a disciple of someone by being the light of the world. That's your first gift. You have 24 hours. But it's the second gift that I want you to focus on. And that's your free will. The choice, the power, the authority that God gave you and Adam and Eve and everybody since the creation of man. The authority, the power, the unmitigated power to be the light of the world and go serve one another in 1037 in the parable of Good Samaritan and go love somebody in John 13, 34 and finally go make disciples of all nations. And if, if you can get those three things right, well, I think you're well on the road to being the light of the world. And so that one day you too may have a, may have a good account before the awesome judgment seat of Christ. Godspeed on your journey.